Isn't that just the best? That's, I wish we start every service. I love that. Evidence of lives being changed and the Holy Spirit at work in people's lives. Isn't that amazing? Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. Come on, y'all stand with us today as we sing together. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know. Everything I need, you've got. There's honey in the rock. Pray for a miracle, thirsty. Amen. He's our firm foundation. Let's sing this new song together again. Christ. 
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I. that today he won't and I've still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense so I won't be going under I'm not
He won't fail. The enemy would like us to believe that he will. The enemy would like us to believe that we're alone and that he's going to let us down, but he won't fail. And I love this passage in 2 Corinthians. I just want to share it with you real quick. The Lord's put it on my heart. This is when Paul was talking about a, a thorn in the flesh and something that was a big struggle for him and it was ongoing. Anybody, anybody feel like that? Anybody able to name your thorn today? It better not be a person sitting next to you. But when he's, when he's talking about this, he says, I asked the Lord, you know, that it would go away. But this is what, uh, what, what the Lord's response was. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, this is Paul now, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ then, I'm content with weakness, insult, hardship, persecution, calamity, for when I am weak, I'm strong. That's a hard thing to believe today, isn't it? When I'm weak, I'm strong. I don't know about you, but I feel like I sometimes have a tendency to just kind of fight a lot and just kind of fight and fight and fight to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. But God says, when you're weak, you're strong. We can praise the Lord for that. We can find a way to praise the Lord. And look all around us. There's honey in the rock. There's provision from the Lord where you would least expect it to come from. And he will not fail. He's your firm foundation. And today I just want to encourage you to sing a song right now about God's faithfulness and about his goodness. And use this as some ammunition against the enemy. If you're going through some spiritual warfare this morning, if you're going through a difficult time, participate right here and right now and worship the Lord because he won't fail. And sing this with us. All throughout my history Your faithfulness has won't be me The winter storms made way for spring In every season from where I'm staying Come on, sing it out. I see the
Amen, church. Continue in that. Have you come to worship this morning? Just praise the Lord on that if you don't mind. Amen. You can be seated just for a moment. Uh, just as a, I guess, a housekeeping thing, just as we have everybody here, I, I don't want to interrupt that worship, but just, uh, I guess, as we worship, to pray. Uh, this past week, we had uh, a call. I had an email from Tim Lee. He was going to be our first speaker in August, but uh, Tim is a, a Vietnam War veteran and uh, has been traveling around for years speaking and advancing the gospel. But he has surgery uh, impending, and it has to be knocked up a little bit uh, sooner. So he is unable to attend uh, be with us. He regretted that so deeply, but we were able to contact Johnny Fain, former pastor of First Baptist Church here in Dothan, and now he found in his leading AIM, which is uh, Attentive Ministry International. And so he is in the Northeast. He's in Vermont right now leading that, but he will be with us the second uh, Monday night in August. We will not have services that first Monday night the first, but he'll be here all August 8th. So as we pray for those things, I want to challenge us to, to pray as we enter into worship further. Uh, we have been worshiping, but as we prepare to hear God's word proclaimed and pray, but just to remind her in that, that we uh, are called to do that. Amen? So can we just enter that uh, meditative state? And I just want to lead us corporately to pray about a few things, if you don't mind, before we see RBC3. So let's, let's join in praying for a moment as I, as, you, as I help lead in that. Father, it is in that truth that we have come to worship. Father, to lift our voices and be unashamed and our hands toward heaven. And I pray now, Father, as you have drawn us, prepared our hearts, God, that you would allow us to hear your voice. And church, I challenge and ask of myself and to you. Father, we enter a time of confession. My dear church family, if there's anything in your heart, if there was anything that would prohibit you from fully, with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, worshiping, can we pause for just a moment and confess that to the Father who knows it already and loves us and is calling us to repentance? Father, we may have guests here, and it is in this thought of prayer that we welcome them and ask you, guests, to let us know who you are. And Ridgecrest, as we pray for those who are not only our guests here, but our guests watching online or just through the week, would you pray God speak to their hearts? hear from heaven. God, we thank you that there are sister churches, not only in this community, but throughout this state and nation and indeed the world. Father, knowing that the kingdom is made up of a diverse body of believers. For those that preach the gospel, that, Father, lean heavily onto your perfect and inerrant word. Church, we now pause to pray for those churches. And that would be co-laborers in the world that the Heavenly Father has placed us.
And now, Father, as a church corporately, we ask for the moment that your word is shared. God, would you, and we pray, that you would anoint those words that you have prepared and allowed to flow from Chase this morning. Father, may they not only be heard, but as we pray now, church, would you pray that those words be embraced and applied for the glory of God. Father, it is in Jesus' name that we know from your word that where we are gathered corporately at this moment, yes, is a place of worship. It is a place that we can be strengthened and encouraged from fellowship. But most of all, Lord, you tell us that this shall and should be known as a house of prayer. So, Father, we offer this to you now in brokenness, but, Father, in sincerity. And ask, Holy Spirit, would you indwell our gathering as we prepare our hearts even further for worship proclamation of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. If you turn your attention now to what is RBC 2 instead of 3, because we had to change the things on Tim Lee. But turn your attention now to Amy Spry. Yeah. Ridgecrest, I'm Amy Spry. I have three minutes to let you know what is happening here and how you can get connected. This is RBC3. We believe everyone needs to be a part of a small group to encourage and push each other in God's Word and biblical community. Now is a perfect time for you to get plugged into a group if you aren't already. So drop by our Welcome Center and let us know you would like to be a part of a connection group. Also, coming up on August 14th is Promotion Sunday, when all of our grade school groups will promote to their upcoming school grades. So make sure you and your family are in a connection group Sunday, August 14th. Lastly, just a reminder for all of our connection group leaders that will be leading in August. There will be a special connection group leader meeting and training on Sunday, August 7th, from 4 until 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. This will be an important time to get on the same page as leaders as we prepare for this important time of the year for our groups. Leaders, you can RSVP for this meeting by next Sunday, July 31st, by calling or emailing Kelly Golden at the church office. Stop by our Welcome Center to get more information on our small groups and prepare for Promotion Sunday coming August 14th. And leaders, RSVP for your Connection Group Leader Meeting set for August 7th from 4 to 6 p.m. Now you're all caught up. I'm Amy Spry and you've been watching RBC3.
Well, good morning. If you will, this morning, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. We're going to study God's Word together in just a moment from that chapter of the Scripture. When you think of the Scripture, though, I do want to challenge us this morning just to be reminded of the power of this book that we hold in our hand. Um, I've said for years to teenagers that this is not just any other book on the shelf. As the Word tells us in the New Testament, this is the living, the active Word of God. And recent studies show us from LifeWay that teenagers that engage personally with the Word of God are more faithful in the church as they graduate high school than those that don't personally engage with the Word of God. And how powerful is that for all of us in the room this morning as we begin our time together to study God's Word to uh, be reminded that our personal engagement with this word is life transforming. And God will use it if we daily spend time in it to God and direct our lives everywhere he wants us to go. I wanna share a message with you this morning entitled, What Would Jesus Do? Now, when I say that um, question and that slogan, many of you think immediately to a really uh, cool looking bracelet with the abbreviation WWJD on it, right? Raise your hand if you're wearing one. Who's wearing a WWJD bracelet? There we go, a few folks in the room wearing uh, bracelets. You can get these on Amazon for about $5 for 12 of them, just if you'd like to know that. Um, that's quick commercial for Amazon. But hey, here's the deal. What would Jesus do? That's the title of today's message, and the heart of that is going to get to two specific questions that come out of that in just a moment. But when we think about that question, what would Jesus do? That question was uh, originated in 1886, 1886, from a series of sermons by a minister from Kansas by the name of Charles Sheldon. Charles Sheldon would share with his uh, congregation that question as he talked through different scenarios and talked through different things that were going on in their life. And he would desire for them to ask themselves seriously, what would Jesus do in this moment? But for you and I, the popularity that we know this slogan as and the, the, the little um, abbreviation that we uh, know today, WWJD, it came from um, 1989 when a leader of a church, uh, excuse me, a youth leader at a church, her name was Janie, and she read Sheldon's book, the uh, pastor that I mentioned a second ago, he wrote a book about the slogan and how it impacted his life. And uh, Janie, this leader in a youth ministry in a church in Michigan, read the book and was greatly transformed by the book and transformed by the slogan. And she wanted her teenagers to have something to remember. And she wanted her teenagers to, to be able to process that question on a daily basis. And so in the, around 1989, in that time frame, there were things that were really uh, exciting and cool called friendship bracelets. Raise your hand if you had a friendship bracelet back in 1980, 1990, something like that. Any friendship bracelets? Still wearing them? Anybody still wearing them? Well, my four-year-old daughter received a friendship bracelet from a little boy in the nursery here at church a few weeks ago, um, and I didn't know how I felt about that. I still haven't talked to that little boy yet. Um, that's to come. But she received that bracelet, and it was all exciting for her. But back in 1989, Janie, this leader of this church, a youth group in Michigan, decided she would make bracelets to be reminded of that question, and she's the one that abbreviated it WW. JD and she she bought originally 300 bracelets and needless to say a lot more of those have been sold uh, to this day but we think about that question and we process that question and I want us to do it specifically in two ways today two ways today as we ask the question what would Jesus do the first is this what would Jesus do if he came into this room today if he came into what we call Ridgecrest Baptist Church, our church here where we worship and seek the Lord together and experience different things, what would he do when he came, if he came in here today? But then secondly, what would he do if he was sitting with you at your favorite spot? For guys in the room, that might be the recliner for a second. You know, if you're a teenager or a young kid in the room, you're like, don't touch dad's chair, especially the remote on the chair, but don't touch his chair. So for guys in the room, it might be the chair. For ladies in the room, it might be your coffee shop, your spot that you like to go, the location that you love to be. What would Jesus do if he sat next to you for a few moments and talked to you about what was going on 
in your life? What would he do if he walked in here and talked to us today about what we are doing or not doing as a church? You know, our pastor has given us this promise as a church that God has given him from Haggai chapter 2, verse 9. In the book of Haggai, God has used greatly in my personal life, and this promise has been a big deal for me. And it says this, Haggai 2, 9, it's on the four-year wall when you walk in, but the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. What a great promise that this house, this church, will experience God in greater ways than we have in the past. What an amazing thought. But there's two specific things that it says also in Haggai chapter 1 that the Lord has convicted me greatly about. And it's what he says in Haggai 1 verse 5 and Haggai 1 verse 7. He says to think, the prophet Haggai says, to think careful about your ways. To consider deeply, the original language is a better way to translate it, is to consider deeply what you and I are doing. The promise of experiencing God in greater ways, his sovereignty and his promise can fall at any point in time. But here's what's also the case. Listen closely to this. You and I in this room can position ourselves to experience God on a daily basis in a deeper way. And this morning, our heart is to, to think deeply about our lives, to think deeply about our church, and to have a desperation for God to work and move personally, but also corporately. I heard a quote this week on a podcast by Pete Scazzaro, and he said this, so much of what we're doing today in the church is not working anymore to deeply change people in the area of discipleship and spiritual growth. We have too many people who are overly comfortable in their spirituality and or have a faith that is in their heads intellectually, but not integrated in their everyday life. The challenge for followers of Christ today to allow that relationship to change everything about our days. And to help us this morning to grasp this a little bit further and open up those questions a little bit deeper that we asked a minute ago about what Jesus would do. We want to read Matthew 21 this morning, verses 12 and 13. If you'll stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word, we'll read these, passage, uh, these verses together and talk a little bit more about what God's teaching us here. Let's, let's read these together. Again, Matthew 21, verse 12. Jesus went into the temple and threw out all those buying and selling he overturned the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of thieves. Let's pray together. Father, this morning we do ask that you would enlighten our hearts, that you would speak to us today. God, would you move in a mighty way as we study your word and may we understand that as we hear from you, your desire is for us to say yes and follow you in the ways that you're leading us to follow you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. As we find ourselves here in Matthew 21, we wanna look a little bit at a background and understand what's happening here in the scripture. Jesus has just found himself entering into Jerusalem for what we would know as the triumphal entry. Many of you know at this moment, Jesus would have been greeted by these words, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But here's what happens in this moment of triumphal entry. Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and where did he go immediately? Where did he go? Starts with a T and ends with an imple. Temple. He goes to the temple. He goes directly to the temple. And for us this morning, it brings us to the place of understanding the importance of this house, the importance of our lives experiencing God and being in his presence and worshiping him. Many scholars tell us that um, twice this happened, that Jesus came into the temple and overturned the tables. Twice that this happened. It happened early at the beginning of his ministry, and then it happened here. There's also things, as you study this, every gospel brings to light this story of what happens as Jesus comes to the temple, which shows great importance to us 
this morning knowing that Jesus went directly to the temple to address some things that were going on there. And as we think of him addressing some things that were going on to the temple, I want to share with you the main idea of this message. The most important thing, if you leave today, I want you to remember this sentence in your mind. Maybe write it down somewhere, put it somewhere, but you have a handout in front of you, hopefully an outline there. And the main idea at the very top of your page is this. God will show me the change and help me make the change. For you and I this day, as we ask the question, what would Jesus do? Our heart is for God to show us the change personally that God wants to do in us. But then also we're thankful for the reality, as Philippians tells us, that it's God at work in us, working and directing our lives, that he will help us make the change. So God will show me the change and help me make the change. First point you'll see there on your outline as well, and I want to share that with you, and then we're going to look deeper at verse 12, but it's this. For all of us in this room, as we ask this question, I want us to evaluate where change is needed. Evaluate. For you and I across this room this morning, evaluate personally, and we'll talk about that in a second, but also corporately, what change and where change is needed in our life. It says in verse 12 again, Jesus went into the temple and he threw out all those buying and selling He overturned the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. It was clear to Jesus where the change was needed. You with me? He walks into the temple and there was no question, it seems like, it was just immediately tables being thrown. And it's an interesting thing there that we don't have time to study uh, and talk about this morning, Jesus doing that, but it shows his desire for the house of God and the importance for the people to realize that desire of him to experience him in the temple versus the things that they were experiencing by selling of the animals. Now here's the deal when you study this and look at this. The leaders in the temple brought these tables into the temple for, in a lot of ways, what they thought a good reason. The people would travel for many uh, miles to come to the temple to, to do the specific temple things that they would do to worship God in that moment. And they had to have an animal to sacrifice. And so the leaders of the temple came up with this idea and they're like, why don't we just sell the animals here so that all people have to do is bring their money with them to the temple and not carry the, the dove or the goat or whatever the whole trek to the temple. It was all a good idea, but what shifted was this. The area in the temple that these money changers were set up was known as the court of the Gentiles. And the court of the Gentiles, if you studied the structure of the temple, was the area of the temple that anyone could come into the temple for the goal of them experiencing God. And what happened, and Jesus makes it clear as he overturns these tables and those throws them out, those that are buying and selling, what happened was they had made that area more ultimately about money than they made about missions. One commentator said it like this, the court of the Gentiles was used for mercenary business, not missionary business. And what an amazing question to, and even thought to ponder this morning that you and I could do something, even it might be something good in our eyes, but it could hinder somebody else from experiencing God. This church, we could do something on a weekly basis and coming in here together, and it could be something that would hinder someone from experiencing God. What a dangerous thought. But also what a powerful thought to lead us this morning to say, God, let that not be the case. May it not be the case of my life that I would do something that would hinder God's presence from being seen. Would it not be the case for our church that we would do something for God's presence to be seen? And so as we think of this point, number one, and evaluating where change is needed, I believe there's two specific areas, again, and I've already mentioned them, but I want to highlight them a little bit deeper, two specific areas for us to evaluate this morning. And as we begin to look at those areas, I also want to encourage you with this thought because evaluation is not easy you with me somebody come up to you like you need to lose some weight bro you're like don't tell me that man I like my fried chicken 
I like my ice cream. You're like, the doctor says that, you're like, oh no, here we go. You know, valuation is not easy. And even taking the seriousness and thinking deeply about what God wants us to do is not easily either. But there's another bracelet and an acronym that got promoted and popular after the WWJD bracelets, and it was this, H-W-L-F. And that means he would love first. So this morning, as we evaluate personally and corporately in just a moment, I wanna remind you that the God of the universe evaluates your life with you in a heart of love. In sitting there with you and saying, I love you, I'm here to help you, and I wanna show you what it is that I need in your life for you to be used for my glory. I'm reminded of that thought if we look at Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12. It says this, Do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe his discipline. For the Lord disciplines the son in whom he delights. So the first area to evaluate this morning is personally. Back to that question. What would Jesus do if he sat with you in your favorite spot? Now in the temple, in the New Testament, they experienced God differently than you and I can experience God today. The Bible tells us in the New Testament that our body is the temple of God. The Bible also says in Hebrews that because of Jesus being our great high priest, we have direct access to the Father and we can boldly go to his throne and experience him. So because of those things, our life is a life of the temple. Our life is a life of experiencing God. So what would Jesus say to you if he sat with you when it comes to you experiencing him. I love what First Chronicles, write this reference down, First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11. This was the verse of the day this past week or one uh, the week before on the Bible app on my phone, and it's just been so profound and something I've read and kind of meditated on. First Chronicles 16, 11 says this, Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. What is it that's going on in your life, in my life, that's keeping me from experiencing the presence of God on a daily basis? It's so easy to be distracted. And a father of four kids is so easy to just get caught up and just, when is bedtime? You know, with me? <laughs> to go to work and to go and play, and I miss God. Tolstoy says this, and he is just a powerful quote. He said, everybody thinks of change in humanity, but nobody thinks of change in himself. And that's, the, that's so true. We all think of changing the person to the left or right of us. You with me? If you're sitting with your spouse, you're like, you need to be listening today. We think about it like that. If you sit next to a brother, you need to listen to this because you've not been a good brother or something like that, brother or sister. We think of changing humanity. Our world needs to be changed, but may it start with me. May it start in my heart. As I was praying and preparing through this message, personally, myself, I was sitting in a local coffee shop wrapping up some things to, to be ready for today. And I got to this moment in preparation when I just felt as if God was just speaking some specific things to me about evaluation of my own personal life. And I, I show you this, I told the first service this, guys in the room, this is a journal, not a diary, okay? This is a journal. And for us men in the room, it's okay to have a journal. It might not be okay to have a diary, but it's okay to have a journal. And I wrote this down on 721-22 this week, and it was just a prayer. And then I said, evaluation of me. And I noted some things that I felt like God was speaking directly to my personal life about things that I needed to, to change and things that I've just made church about or things I've made my relationship with God about. And it was some things personal again that I needed to work through. And so the first challenge this morning is to evaluate where change is needed personally, but then secondly, corporately. For all of us in this room, we call ourselves the, the church, Ridgecrest here uh, on Fortner Street. What would Jesus do if he walked into this place today? Listen to Psalm 69, verses 8 and 9. You might want to jot that reference down. Psalm 69, verses 8 and 9. The psalmist says this, I've become a stranger to my brothers and a foreigner to my mother's sons because... Zeal for the house of God consumes me. Can we as a church say that the zeal, the desire for the things of God is most important than anything else in my life and in our lives corporately? You know, right here in Matthew 21, the people really came up, first off, with an easy plan. 
Y'all with me? They're like, this would be easier. And as churches, it's easy for us to come up with easy plans. Like, this is, this is an easy way to do this, or this is an easy way to do that. Doing student ministry for many years, I was all about a plan. You can ask some of these teenagers over here, and they would say, if I got off the plan, Chase's stress level goes through the roof. I was all about a plan. But it was so easy to make a plan and miss God. Secondly, we see right here the people in Matthew 21, they came up with something that was comfortable. It was comfortable for the people not to have to carry the goat or carry the dove to the, uh, the temple to sacrifice. And it's really easy for us in the room as a church to just get comfortable where we are. The third thing we see in Matthew 21 here that the people did, they came up with a plan that benefited them. All about them. Like, we can set this up like this and for this way, and it's going to help us. And then lastly, kind of in the same boat, it says this. The, the people, and I thought about this in Matthew 21, they came up with a plan that benefited the earthly kingdom, not the heavenly kingdom. And a lot of times as churches in our world today, it can be so easy to focus on the earthly kingdom, us and what we need, versus really what God wants and us experiencing his heavenly kingdom. I love what David Platt says. He says, the greatest hindrance in the church today is the people of God doing the work of God without the power of God. The greatest hindrance in the church today is the people of God doing the work of God without the power of God. So evaluation. How did it happen here in the temple in Matthew chapter 21? Well, there's three things specific that take place. The first is Jesus went into the temple. So if you want to evaluate your life personally or corporately this morning, first thing we need to make sure we do is let Jesus in. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. That's the start. Walking with God through his son, Jesus Christ, is the beginning of the presence of God and God using you to change the world for his glory. Maybe have a relationship this morning, but you're like, Chase, I'm just not where I need to be. What do I do? How do I evaluate what I need to do? Let Jesus in. Let Jesus in your heart. A heart of surrender, a heart of prayer. Second thing we see that happens right here is Jesus threw out some things. So if we want to evaluate some things in our heart and figure out what it is that we need to change, we need to let Jesus throw out some stuff. I believe God wants to get rid of some things in your life that are keeping you, obviously, from experiencing him. Then lastly, Jesus overturns some stuff. So if you want to evaluate personally, let Jesus in, let him throw some things out, and then let him overturn some stuff. Think about that for a second. He overturns some stuff. For us in the world today, a lot of what we make our life is about us. We build our own kingdoms. We make us look good. But the heart of what you see Jesus here as he overturns these tables is just an illustration for us to think about turning things over and let Jesus do that and making things about him. Making things about his kingdom. Allowing him to overturn things in our life that we've made about ourselves compared to the things that are about him. So evaluate where change is needed personally and corporately. I feel like I've officially hit dad's life status. And it's not because I have four kids. So hear me out for a second. Found myself a couple weeks ago getting really into a National Geographic documentary on national parks. <laughs> Guys in the room, you with me for a second? You're like, what is going on? But I'm into these national park documentaries, like into them, like Collins, Asher coming into the room, like dad's watching his show. It's one of those like, don't touch the remote. And they're like, what are you watching, dad? What is this? But here's the deal. I'm watching this national park documentary about Yosemite and Yellowstone and the Grand Canyon and the Smoky Mountains and all that kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm in all of the beauty of the park. But also what's been intriguing is listening to the people that have helped the parks become what they are today. People like President Abraham Lincoln that signed the Yosemite Valley Grant in 1864 that he said this, upon the express conditions that the premises shall be held for public use, resort, and recreation. 
President Roosevelt in 1901 had a desire to create what's known as the United States Forest Service, and he established 150 national parks, 51 federal bird reserves, four national game preserves, five national parks, and 18 national monuments. Then in 1916, President Wilson signed the act creating the National Park Service. And then lastly, one of the also important key moments of our history in these parks is that President Roosevelt, the 32nd president of our United States, signed, uh, signed military, excuse me, executive order 6166, consolidating all national parks and national monuments. And what I've learned and seen is simply this when it comes to these people is that someone evaluated and understood excuse me, understood the need for measure, uh, specific things to be done and measures to be taken to protect these lands and let them be what they were created to be. And that's the same challenge for us this morning. The opportunity for you and I today as the church, personally and corporately, is to evaluate our life and say, God, show me the change But then God, help me make the change to be a follower of Christ, to let a lost and dying world understand the goodness of God and be changed by his love and grace. So this morning, firstly, evaluate where change is needed. But here's what's important. We can't stay there. And a lot of times it's easy to stay there. You're like, okay, I got it. I need to lose some weight or I need to do this or I need to do that. But we never take steps towards it. So as we close this morning, second point to help us take those steps is experience the change. We see here in Matthew 21, verse 12, where Jesus clearly evaluated the change and brings the change to light in what needed to happen in the temple. But here also in verse 13, we're gonna see a little bit deeper about how you and I can experience the change. And Jesus made it clear to his followers what it looked like to be the church. And he says this, he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of? Let's try that one more time. I'm gonna pause. And in that moment of pause, you say the next word in the verse. Okay, here we go. It is said, he said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of, but you are making it a den of thieves. What I love of what happens here in the scripture is that Jesus never just talked about something and never did anything. Jesus here in verses 14 and 17, verses 14 through 17 demonstrated what he's talking about. He engaged with people. He healed people in the temple. He was praised by little children here in the temple. And so the experience of the change is important for you and I today. One commentator said this as I studied this past week for today. He said, what does God want in his house? God wants prayer among his people. For true prayer is an evidence of our dependence on God and our faith in his word. What does God want? What's the change that God wants in our house? And what's the, God, the change that God wants in my heart? Well, it's ultimately you and I taking seriously the things of God over anything else in the world. So how do we experience and embrace that change? Well, I think we do as we unpack this sentence that Jesus shared about the temple. And I want us to do that together again. It says this, It is written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of thieves. I want us to unpack that first part together and do a little deeper dive into the study of those words to understand how you and I can really daily experience change. The first part of that, it says this, is my house, my house. Again, be reminded this morning, speaking of the temple, the corporate worship gathering, but also reminded that the New Testament says that we are the temple of God. So corporate gathering in us My house, that word my in the original language shows a prominent thought towards Jesus and his um, just deity of being God. So when Jesus says my house, those words show again that Jesus was fully God, but also that the temple was all about him. So how do you and I on a daily basis experience the change that God is calling us to make? We make our life on a daily basis all about him. 
It's so easy, again, to be caught up in all the different things and be distracted in all the different ways when, again, daily life is all about him. Seek uh, Matthew 6.33, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But then he goes on to say, not only my house, life should be all about him, will be called. Those three words, as we dive deeper into them in the original language, we see that that word called is the word that brings out purpose and plan. So how do you and I experience the change that God's calling us to make? Well, we do it by making life all about God, all about Jesus, but we also do it by focusing on the clear plan and the purpose that God has for our life. Jesus was making it clear. There was a plan and a purpose for the temple. It was not to sell doves. It was not to to sell anything or to make about anything. It was about being a house of prayer, seeking God. And the same is true for you and I today. God has a clear plan and a purpose for your life. Oldest person in the room to the youngest person in the room. No accidents. That God, Ephesians 2.10, you're his masterpiece, his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he prepared in advance for you to do. So experiencing the change on a daily basis will come as we seek God's clear plan and purpose above all else. Then lastly, he says the famous word, the words, a house of prayer. These words, again, show us that God is serious about prayer. It's not just a a bedtime thing, not just a mealtime thing. It is a serious conversation that we begin and just continue in on a daily basis talking to God. But also in that, again, he's serious about us personally seeking him. Listen to Isaiah 56, 7. Isaiah 56, 7 is actually what Jesus quotes here in Matthew 21. It says this, I will bring them to my holy mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. R.C. Sproul, a a very popular um, preacher and teacher and, and writer, says this, Jesus did not call the temple a house of sacrifices or a house of preaching. He called it a house of prayer. The temple's chief designation was that it was to be the focal point of the nation and of the people of prayer. Great importance to making our lives, making the things of God and seeking him serious. So experience the change. I love how we go back to that main idea where God will show us the change. And a lot of times we, we feel that. I mean, we, we feel it. Like me earlier, I wrote those things down. I felt that change. But thankfully we serve a God that doesn't just say good luck. That doesn't just say go for it. No, he says, I'm a God that's with you. I'm a God that the power that's in you is greater than the power that's in this world. And I will help you make the change if you allow me to make, help you make the change. So experience that change. As I think of people taking serious, seeking God and the importance of the things of God and the importance of the things of this church, it takes me back to a young guy um, Growing up in this church, sitting over here in this area, and y'all know all y'all over here, y'all like this area people. Y'all know what I mean? You like sit in the same spot every week for some reason. I don't know. But we were this area people. We still are. My parents are sitting in this area right over here. And I'd come to church and I would, thankful for my parents' leadership and, and having me here and, and, and making sure the important things in our, our life were um, the things of God and things like that. But also growing up, There was specific situations that made a great difference in my life, and it's the the desire that my grandparents had to seek the Lord. My mom's parents are sitting back here today, and I remember as I was growing up, I would go to Mama's house, and Mama's here in the room now. My grandmother was in the first service, and it was fun to share this, but I remember going to Mama's house, and I'd go to Mama's house because you know there's good food at Mama's house. Y'all with me? And there still is. She invited me to lunch earlier. <laughs> There's still good food at Mama's house. But I remember going to Mama's house on Monday nights. And I remember Pa, my grandfather, leaving as a little kid. I remember him leaving before dinner was over. And I'm like, There's pound cake to come. 
with ice cream and strawberries tonight. Like, this is a good thing. And Pa just left the house. Well, I got uh, older in life and realized where Pa was going every Monday night. He was going to his church for prayer time, Pa. Where he and some guys would meet together with the pastor and they would seek the face of God and pray together and ask God to move in their church and their lives and their families and different things. And I remember that, and I remember that to this day about how there was a grandparents and parents that faithfully took seriously experiencing God, and they were a challenge for me. And so that's the challenge for us. If we today take this seriously, search deep within us and say, God, help me to see these changes, and God, help me to make these changes, God will use you and I in this room to make a great difference for his honor and for his glory. As we close this morning, here's what I want us to do before Bradley and the team come and lead us in a time of invitation through song. I want us to have a time of response. Everybody in the room at your chair. At the bottom of your handout there, you'll see some closing prayers and closing questions that I want to just lead us through making this a house of prayer for a few moments this morning and asking God of some things of us and then praying and seeking his face together. These are three questions that the Lord in the last month to two months have opened my eyes to ask myself, to to seek his face seriously, to to really make sure that I was where he needed, he wanted me to be. And so if we can do this together, if you wanna look on your handout there, if you're watching online, they'll be on the screen as well. But the first question is this, am I just religious? What a dangerous question to, to really think about and how easy it is just to go through life and just be in the motions. Go through life just doing what we need to do to get through each day. Am I just religious? Would you bow your heads with me in the room for a time of prayer? For you personally, right where you're sitting, to seek God and his face and his help and pray this response that's on your handout or that you see on the screen. God, help me daily to experience your presence. Would you pray that in your seat this morning? Would you pray that if you're watching online this morning? That prayer, God, help me daily to experience your presence. Second question we see here on our handout and it's gonna be on the screen as we reflect on where we are this morning and the change that needs to be made. The second question, am I daily recognizing God? In everything in my life, am I daily recognizing God? We asked that question in our house at our kitchen table a few weeks ago and my four-year-old daughter experienced God that day in her baby dolls. My seven and nine-year-old son experienced God that day in Legos. And God opened my heart in that moment to just knowing that he's in all the details. So if we wanna experience change in him, can we ask that question, am I daily recognizing God? Would you bow your head and pray this prayer of response with me? God, help me daily to seek you at work in all the details of my life. God, help me daily to see you at work in all the details of my life.
Then lastly this morning, this last question, and I encourage you to put these questions somewhere, put these prayer responses somewhere and, and pray them on a daily basis. But the last thing is this, am I living a life of repentance? Am I daily living a life of repentance, of turning from where I've made life about me and turning to experience the forgiveness and the grace and love and making life all about God? Let's bow our head one last time and, and pray in response today this prayer. God, help me to daily be broken over what breaks your heart. God, help me today to be broken over what breaks your heart. Father, again, we thank you for our time together of studying your word this morning, of worshiping you. God, I do pray that we would evaluate where change is needed. It's so easy, as we've said, for all of us in the room to make life about something that it's not. God, may you convict us if we're just being religious. God, convict us if we're not daily recognizing you. And God, convict us if we're not living a life of repentance. Help us, God, to seek your face and your presence above all things. Help us, God, to see you at work in all the details of our life. God, help us as well to be broken over what breaks your heart and to experience the true change that you would have for us to experience, to then ultimately make a difference for your kingdom. God, as well, would you move now in this time of invitation, specific invitation of calling for someone to follow you. If there's ever anyone in the room that doesn't have a relationship, if they haven't began this process of walking with you, of letting you in their life, that you would call them to yourself this morning. Would you move in their heart if anyone needs to make that decision? Would you move if anyone needs to to follow you in baptism or join our church or just come to this altar and make this a house of prayer in a deeper way. Father, would you move in a mighty way during this time of invitation? It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. In preparing for today's sermon and the chance to share, I came into the house on Monday um, after Chuck and I talked that morning and we did a big staff switcheroo and getting things cleared up to who was going to preach when. And I came in and Collins, our nine-year-old, was sitting at the bar working on some art project or something there at the bar. And he, I came in and I said, Dad, guess what, buddy? Dad gets to preach Sunday. And he's, he said, oh, cool, Dad. He said, what are you going to preach on is what Collins said. And I said this to Collins as he was sitting there at the bar. Here's how it went. I said, I'm preaching about Jesus. And he didn't really give me a chance to finish the sentence. I was gonna say I'm preaching about Jesus turning over the tables in the temple is what I was gonna tell him. But he stopped me mid-sentence and here's what he said. I said, I'm preaching about Jesus. And Collins, my nine-year-old sitting there right there at the table, he said, well, obviously. <laughs> and in a moment, standing there in my kitchen, I couldn't help but think, man, it's all about him. We make it about so many different things, but it's all about Jesus and what he's leading us to do in our life. This morning as we close, I'll be down front, other staff will be at the aisles, and you may be here this morning and need to follow Jesus. You need that relationship that only God can give through his son Christ, and you need to come down and see myself or another staff member and let us know of that decision, and we'll be so excited. That understanding that you're a sinner that your sin has separated you from God, but God loved you so that he sent his son to die, to bring life and hope. And he was resurrected again on the third day to bring that life and hope. So maybe today you need to follow Christ. Secondly, today, maybe you're looking for a church home and Ridgecrest may need to be that church home for you. If you're interested in joining our church, you can come down forward and make that decision as well. And then lastly, maybe today, the decision that you need to make is just to come to this altar and to take seriously what Jesus said and it being a house of prayer. 
and seeking his face in areas of evaluation and change that's in your life. So as Bradley and the team lead, Chuck and I and some others will be here, come forward and respond as God leads you to respond. You can stand.